What is going on, everybody? This is Collective Podcast here. Jerry speaking, always. Christian, always ignoring me to my center. Christian, how are you doing today? I'm feeling awesome. This is 15 episodes in, Jerry, from last March. Did you think that that's we were unbelievable? Going, did you think that we were ever going to get Larry Sharp or somebody of his caliber on the podcast? Christian, if I have to listen to you, I'll listen to anybody. All right, so this is great, guys. So uh, I, we've been hyping it up for weeks, hyping it up for I think two or three, three weeks since we've announced it in early October. Larry Sharp will be here in a little bit. He's on his way. We just got confirmation, and uh, we're going to be sitting there. We're going to be talking to him everything from. His infrastructure plan, his healthcare plan, his school plan, um, uh, uh, drugs like weed and and just opioids and stuff. It, it's it's a great. It's going to be a great hour of just talking about local politics and Staten Island. We're going to talk about Staten Island. We're going to talk about New York. Everything. It all counts. So definitely support your politicians, whoever that is, and get ready for the interview with Larry Sharp. Here we go. What's going on, everybody? This is Jerry and Christian for Collective Podcast, episode 15. We have a very special guest running for the Libertarian governor's seat for our New York election, Larry Sharp. Christian, how are you feeling about this going in? I'm nervous. (laughs) Uh, It's our first big, big podcast with our videocast slash podcast. So we have the video. It's on the GoPro. As you can see, wave. And uh, you got to and, see two of us right and, here. Uh, I don't know why it's purple, but it's uh, but the screen. Uh, of course, we're always trying to advance the podcast further along, and here we go, the uh, video cast with Jerry and Christian. And uh, let's get to the interview. Let's do this. What is going on, everybody? This is Collective Podcast here, episode 15. We have Jerry, Christian, and our special guest running for governor of New York, Larry Sharp. I am here, guys. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So, Larry, I was just curious to know, what is one quote in your life that you've always stuck by? There's a lot of them. There really are. Um, But I think one of the biggest ones is is always the Gandhi quote, be the change you want in the world. Right. That's, That's a big one for me. Um, But then there's another one that's kind of funny too, which is an odd one from The Matrix, and that is, there is no spoon. (laughs) Ah, there you go. Do you remember that one? Uh, Yes, 100%. The the kid kid is bending the spoon. For those of you who don't know or listening, the kid's bending a spoon, and The Matrix, of course, nothing actually exists, right? So (laughs) it's all just a facade. So he says, the kid says to uh, Keanu Reeves, the, the, the main character, he says, when bending the spoon, there's one truth you have to always remember. He goes, what's that? He goes, there is no spoon. (laughs) <laughs> very intriguing yes which tells me that remember something it, most of this is a facade yeah <laughs> right so I wow. like that one too so there's a couple quotes I like but those two are good ones now in the follow up to that how has that kind of directed you to where you are today I don't know what that means sure so in terms of like with, with a quote such as that like ah, how has yes. it kind of like influenced you in your yeah, everyday no, life the number one thing if you, is you see that I'm running a campaign that previous libertarians have never run a campaign in New York State like sure. mine right New York State, we've had some decent campaigns, all right? Warren Reddick was one that was a very good campaign, but nothing like this. I mean, this is a campaign where literally I've gone to all 62 counties, every one of them. I've raised a half million dollars. Um, I have a team that is dozens of people, if I count volunteers, hundreds. So we have people who are doing random sign waves, building signs, we have an infrastructure. I mean, we are doing a lot. This is... I wanted, as I said, to be the change, right, that I want to see in the world. I want libertarians, and to be forward, all third parties also, right? Obviously, I'm biased. I'm a libertarian. I want my party to do well. Of course. But I also want all third parties to do well because third parties are the way of making actual change, right? The left-right paradigm simply doesn't work. We just hate each other. Nothing changes. So I want them to realize it's not good enough to just go, I'm going to run for office, then go home. If you're going to step up and say, yeah, if you're going to get up and say, I'm going to run for office, Go run for office or don't run. Help someone else. If you're in a position where you can run, please run. If you're not in a position to run, then help someone. Uh, Everyone's in a position to help in some way, shape, or form, right? Even if you're struggling, you can at least be a keyboard warrior, right? Someone, you can help. Everyone can help in some way. So if you can run, run. If you can't run, help. 
Hey, with his setup, he's definitely known to be the keyboard warrior. There we go. Oh, I like I it. <laughs> so, like, you mentioned third party. So, sure. like, I, there's a lot of stigma about third parties. Sure. I'm a third party libertarian. There we go. Uh, I'm a, so, um, I'm ho- I hope I have you vote that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. There we go. Uh, I don't want to hear it. Good. All right. Um, See, you got one point. Both. 1.5 million more, and I win. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it takes. So, um, I know there's a lot of stigma with that. Oh, you vote for third party, you split in the vote, yep. or whatever. Um, I explain to people why that stigma should not even be. People yeah. shouldn't even be saying it. It's silly for several reasons. Number one, you're not splitting a vote because a lot of people who are coming to third parties are those who don't vote. Right, third party is notorious for bringing on people who weren't going to vote anyway. Right, in New York State, give or take sixty to seventy percent of our population doesn't even bother voting; they don't show up to the polls. So, so ridiculous. Yeah. So how in the world am I splitting a vote when these people weren't going to vote anyway? That's number one. But the second thing is, let's say it's true and you're splitting a vote. I have an idea. How about have a better candidate? Hmm. How about have a better candidate with better ideas and stop fighting the left-right paradigm of he's more evil than me? And instead, show some people a reason to vote. We're voting for the lesser of two evils, which means we still get evil. And we have people saying, don't do, you know, you have to vote for the lesser of two evils because the other guy's even worse. I have an idea. Get better candidates. If we have a third party, it will make the other two old parties better. Right now, try to find, try to find an actual policy or positive outlook for either party. You can't. Have you seen their ads? Oh my God, their ads are horrible. It's just, this other guy's evil. He's a murderer. You see it all the time. That's all you see. And, and then the, the, actual, the actual policy, the Republicans' policy is Cuomo's corrupt. That's his policy. How does that help anybody? Exactly. How does it make anything better, right? And Cuomo's policy is Trump is evil. Trump's not even running for governor. <laughs> yeah, it's such an apples to oranges He's not even thing. running for governor. And then how does that help anybody? No one's being helped by anything. But all of a sudden, here comes Larry Sharp. And now we have fear. And what you see, particularly from the right, the right's been worse than the left here because the left is, is winning right now in New York right. State. So they're not that worried. The right's worried that they're going to lose their second class status and go third class status. They're worried. So what's the right doing? We have to fight Larry Sharp. How do we fight him? Ah, I have an idea. How about by having a better candidate with better ideas? No way. Too much work. We'll just smear a campaign. We'll just call him a bad guy. What they don't get is that works very well when you only have two parties. Yeah. Smearing does work when you only have two parties. It's true because one of two things happen. People get so disenchanted they don't vote. That's common. As I said, 60 to 70% of people don't vote. Or two, they're so afraid of the other guy, they vote for you. So it does work when it's two parties. But when there's three, it doesn't. Because when it's three, when I, when I make one guy evil, is the other guy, maybe he is, maybe the other guy isn't. Uh, it doesn't become the black and white, left and right. So it doesn't work as well. In fact, when you're a third party, the negative campaigning often is more press. So it actually yeah. gets people to look you up. Hmm. So people who wouldn't know who I am now know because they're painting me as the bad guy. But painting me as the bad guy, at least they know who I am. You can kind of tell when people are leaning towards your side of things, they, their time is more invested into what you're trying to do. Yes. There's Absolutely. always that alternative that, like, let's say if someone's, like, observing something from a Democratic standpoint, Republican standpoint, 30 seconds, it's a lot more shallow and chastised always. in comparison to an alternative option. Well, you've made a valid point here, and this is the problem. The old parties only know the old ways, and the old ways are 30-second <clears throat> sound bites and pictures. They don't realize how I'm winning people. I'm yeah. winning people with long form. If you've noticed, I'm winning people with things like this. Right? This, is a long, this is a longer form interview where I can speak, we can ask questions, we can talk about things. You saw I did Joe Rogan, I did Dave Smith, I did Dave Rubin, I did Glenn Beck. So I do the long form interviews. Right? These guys can't do long form right. because they have no policy. They haven't thought anything through. Right? The Republican knows he's not going to win. His policy is a joke anyway. He's not, never going to win. He knows that. <laughs> he knew he was never going to win from the beginning. I mean, he started running in April. How do you win, or May, whenever he started running? How do you win running in May against, against Cuomo? It's impossible, right? No way he, he was going to win, so his policies are, are irrelevant. And Cuomo doesn't have their policies because he's going to win and shut up. That's how he thinks. Yeah. So who cares, right? So they, can, they can't do long form. But I can. I can talk about how I care about people, how I want things to be better. I can talk about actual policies that don't punish, but instead get reward people for good behavior. I can talk about policies where I give people opportunity and they want to come back to the state. 
I can talk about those details. They can't. So it's interesting you bring up that point because of having more economic thrive in New York City. There was a plan that I was looking at within like your caliber about the community tax credit plan. Now, yep. I'm somebody who's in the nonprofit field. Sure. I work for the JZC as a special events director. Sure. So what I was curious to know is how is that going to be planned as far as like how the implementation works? Yeah, we're going to copy how it works right now in, in Arizona. This is not, I wish it was my own idea. I've made up all myself. It isn't. It's a copy plan from that audio that already works in Arizona. Arizona's had it for several years now, and it took some time to catch on. It will probably take time to catch on here of too, course. right? There will oh, any new idea. There will always be early adopters, right? That's how it works in, in anything, right? So there'll be some early adopters. Maybe a guy like you will jump on it right away, and right. you get a bunch of people who will help you out. What happens is you decide, you know what? My tax bill is going to go to the state, X dollars. I don't want though. I don't want five hundred bucks of that to go to go to the state. So I have an option. I can take two fifty and give it to any charity in the state, and another two fifty. If a state, if a charity is in my own county, so if I have, if I give both to my county, I can give five hundred to one, or two separate, right? The goal is to try to put some of your money back into your county. That's the goal, right? Kind of to a peer to peer standpoint. So I'm somebody who does like a lot of fifty fifties for events and stuff like Bingo. that. It's very similar to that. Absolutely, concept. yes, because I want you to put it back into your community, right? Because the concept is, <laughs> you know more what your community wants than Albany does. Yeah. So if I can get you to put more money into your own community, but something else begins to happen. This now becomes a trend people can watch and they can see what people are putting money into. When people see it, that's the needs of the community, right? That's the need. I don't have to have Albany deciding, well, I think this community needs X or needs Y. Look at where the money's going. Exactly. Well, the money's all going to whatever, JCC. Okay, people care about this. Right. Let, let's do something, right? It's going to health care. It's going to child care. It's going to elder care. It's going to whatever, special needs kids, wherever it's going. It's going there. People want and or need that. All right. So it, not only will it help out those organizations, but it will also show the market. It will also show the consumer. It will show the government what that community is looking for. Very good. Another point to kind of go into as we're very intrigued by your healthcare plan. Mm -hmm. And one of the essences of what we were looking into was the idea of developing low cost cash only clinics. Yep. I wanted to hear a little bit more as to where you've come up with that idea. Yeah, but it's not just cash only. Sure. I mean, clear. Mm -hmm. Saying cash only makes people think it's, it's only cash. Got it. It's just direct. Yeah. Right. To go. make sure it's direct. It could be check, <laughs> credit card, debit card, insert thing here. So make sure people understand that. It's not just cash. Got it. But it's just direct pay. Right, direct pay. You're pulling the insurance people out. And the reason is, right now, if you're on Medicaid particularly, but almost any insurance plan, it's not self-directed healthcare, right? Mm. It's Medicaid-directed healthcare. Medicaid tells you what doctor you can use. Medicaid tells you what you can get. Medicaid tells you what things you can do and how much they value. Well, what about you and your doctor? What about you and your community? What about you and your family, right? These go away in this idea. So what happens is you have a two-tiered system which is if you have money, you get specialized insurance, or you just pay cash, or you just pay with a check out your credit card, right? If you go right now, look, look at Manhattan. Try to find a really good doctor taking insurance. You're struggling. Yeah. You are gonna struggle to find a good doctor who takes insurance. They exist, but you're gonna struggle. And the problem is, what if it's not your neighborhood? So as a follow-up to that, what do you feel about sites such as like a ZocDoc and things of that sort? Do you feel like that's a necessary way to kind of like stimulate the competition in terms of finding the best care? I, I think the answer is giving people more opportunity to pay directly. Sure. Most people don't even know what that is. And one of the things I brought up in my plan, part of my plan, be clear, the healthcare plan has to be a massive plan with lots of different ideas and concepts. Right. Because it's a hard, a huge problem. But one of those is the Medicaid issue where you actually allow people to have um, a healthcare debit account. So right now, if you wanna to go to, uh, if you have Medicaid, you just go to wherever the Medicaid tells you. It's not, it's not self-directed at all. Yeah. But instead, we give you an actual debit card, right? Yeah. And you get an amount of money put into that card per year based upon what category you fit within Medicaid, right? So if you're a, for example, a child with no pre-existing condition, I think it's a couple thousand dollars. If it's an adult with a with with a disability, I think it's like forty some odd thousand dollars, whatever that number is, right? You put that number in, you have that in your card. You can use that wherever you want. Very good point. Now, if you use that wherever you want, you will go to direct care. When direct care people know that that's a viable option for them, they will market to them. When they begin to market to them, what will happen? As has happened in every single 
non-essential medical service uh, arena, prices will go down, service will go up, technology will go up. Every time, that's a, a 100% rule. And it's very rare, 100% rule, 100% rule. It's always happened. That'll begin to happen, but here's the best part. I hope, say you're on Medicaid now, hmm. and now you get a chance to go to a doctor who's local to you, who you like, who you think is a talented doctor. And you go and you swap your car. You go, this is great. My, the, my appointment's at 2 o'clock. I get seen at 2.05. Nice. Versus 2 o'clock, gets in at 3.45. Hmm. The doctor actually talks to me. Ask me about things like, how are you sleeping? How are your stresses? How are you eating? The doctor she talks to you. You're like, this is great. It kind of gives to like uh, a comparison to Uber in terms of like navigating like where that person's gonna yeah. be too. Yeah. So now the next thing happens is this happened. You like this. Well, now you realize, man, I only have a certain amount of money on my on my healthcare account. Yeah. So now you have a couple of things. Number one, you'll start to shop for lower prices because you don't want to go back to the regular Medicaid system because that's the answer. When you run out from your swipe, you go back to regular Medicaid. Well, that doctor doesn't take Medicaid. You're gonna lose your doctor now. Mm. Which makes you think, how do I get the right doctor and something else? How do I get off Medicaid? It encourages you as the individual to decide, how do I get off Medicaid and how do I find good doctors for cheap? It encourages you, the individual, to do that. Now again, most people won't, being forward, that's how it works. But a bunch will. And as they begin to do it, their early doctors pop in, now this encourages doctors to be cheaper and people get off Medicaid and people get the feeling of having a good doctor who they like, who's convenient, who they want to be around. And that's what I want. I don't want people to assume that the only doctor I get is the one the government says I can have. Right. And that's where we are right now. It's not self-directed. I want to be self-directed. Did I answer your question or no? I would say so, absolutely. That, that also, um, I know um, Rand Paul came up with that plan uh, when they were voting on Obamacare. Sure. Way back, way back early, like a year yes. and a half ago. Um, that just didn't get through, which I was just crazed, like, why? The, like, there's just, yeah. a lot of these ideas that come, come on up, but they sound crazy. They're not. Yeah. They're just bold, and I'm basing them off of what I think works already. They just compete. Yes, it's, it's yeah. good. I mean, I, I, want, I want the individual person to decide, you know, I don't want Medicaid. There's another option. The sad part is, for most people, medi most people who are on Medicaid, I shouldn't say most people, for most people who are on Medicaid, you know, this is the best they're going to get. And I understand why they do it. It's the best mm. they're going to get. I don't want that to be the case. I don't want the best you're ever going to get to be Medicaid. Exactly. That's just not, I'm not okay with that. If you have to go there because that's where you are right now, that's what happens. I get it. People fall down. People, you know, have problems. I get it. People in situations that are very tough for them. I get it. But that shouldn't be the best you're ever going to get. Mm. Right? And for we have sure. to get people to know that that's not the best you're ever going to get. Now, uh, to Christian's credit, there's a question that we wanted to ask you that he came up with that I felt was very, like, well accommodated for this interview, so I wanted you to ask this yeah. one. So, uh, marijuana is big, um, and I read somewhere that the Trump administration uh, a couple weeks is going to vote on just deregulating it and leaving it up to the states to decide how they wanted to, to um, like, regulate it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you said we should regulate cannabis like onions. Yes, Explain um, how that would work. Like onions, with one minor exception. And the minor exception is you have to be 18 years or older to purchase it. Hmm. Right? You don't have to be 18 years or older to purchase onions. Yeah. So with the exception, you must be 18 years or older. But otherwise, exactly like onions. Hmm. Meaning if you're a farmer, and I tell this all the time, right? Hmm. If you're a farmer, do, you want, do I want to get a special license to grow hemp and cannabis? In Colorado, in California, in Washington State, that's true. And that's a disaster. Yeah. All that does is help big business and hurt small business. Mm -hmm. I want you as a farmer. Like, I'm not a farmer. So I don't know if that's a good cash crop for you or not. But guess who does know? The farmer. Yeah. The farmer knows if this is a good ca cash crop for him or her. If it's a good cash crop for you, grow it. If you think cannabis is a good cash crop or hemp is a good cash crop, do it. Grow it. I'm going to focus on small businesses. Mm -hmm. Why? Small farmers are the key to success here. The odds of us, and this is my opinion. Some people disagree with this. The odds, I think, of us being able to compete with the huge grows of California, I think is going to be very difficult because they've got years advanced, good climate. It's, it, they, we've got years to catch up. Yeah. But can we do craft grows? Yeah. And we have an industry for it already. It's the beer industry. So we already have an industry that's already worked well for us. We have a culture for it. So why wouldn't we create craft grows, right? Craft grows of hemp, craft grows of cannabis. If we begin to treat our small farmers like small businesses, They'll get lower insurance costs, lower workers' comp, and also they will be able to get small business loans. Hmm. 
which means we'll, get, we'll create a craft, grow community, particularly in upstate New York, but all over, but particularly in upstate New York. You can see that happen. Now, why do I say onions again? Just go grow it if you want to. Just go sell it if you want to. Just go sell it if you want to. Why would I bother? But not just that. What if you're one of the hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who have chronic pain? Right now, one of your options is opioids. Great. Now you can get addicted, be part of the addict community. Uh, how about instead, take a cannabis product, hmm. right? Have an edible or a liquid or a smoke it, whatever is your thing. Vape it. I don't care. Do whatever you think is right for you. Yeah. Go ahead and do that. But Larry, some people are poor. Yeah, they are. So great. Here's what you can do. Grow your medicine in your backyard. You can grow onions, can't you? Hmm. Go, go, grow, medicine, grow your medicine in your backyard. I don't so, have a problem with that. So I want people to be happy. To kind of go into your point as well, so statistically speaking on Staten Island, our rate of lung cancer is 35% higher than the other boroughs like surrounding. Wow. So something to kind of like go into that perspective, like I wonder how much impact that can really be for like our Staten Island community there too. Could you imagine if people were taking yeah. edibles instead? Yeah, the number would go down. Yes, imagine yeah. if people were taking edibles instead, right? be awesome or liquids or insert thing here right whatever the thing is right I, I mean come on but not just that if you get cancer you have to go through chemotherapy cannabis helps that yeah mm. so even if, if you got cancer you'd have a better chance of being cured and this is gonna sound crazy but one of the reasons why I'm on this train my father died when I was a kid mm. he had cancer in the late 70s mm. right late 70s he had cancer he went through horrible chemotherapy back then if you knew how bad yeah. that was it was horrible back then so bad. You know what happened? My father was a, was a corrections officer at Rikers Island. Ooh. So he, he knew a lot of law enforcement. So there were cop friends he had who would take him into the squad car and would let him smoke weed in the, squ in, in the, in the squad car that they had confiscated from somebody. Ooh. It's the 70s. That, that's crazy. They knew back then. And these are cops. Literally, he's smoking in the squad car. Wow. Insane. Um, yes, insane. So, like, I know, like, a lot of a lot of older generations will complain like, oh, weed impairs you. So like, for like, if you're driving or you're operating a machinery, would you um, do something like alcohol where it was like, of if course. you're operating, like you get a DUI? Abs yeah. Look, is, the, is there a way right now, if you're driving on the influence of say, I don't know, Valium or something, mm -hmm. right? There's a law against that, right? Yeah. It's the same law. Yeah. Don't be impaired. Yes, yeah. don't be impaired. And the reality of it is, you're more apt to be impaired under Valium or something like that than you would be for, for weed. Because people know that weed makes you impaired, just like people know that alcohol makes you impaired. And we have a drop in DUI and DWI because people are knowing that I get impaired. Yeah. They get it. So that's why we have you know um, designated driver programs and take the keys, right? The culture is changing to make that happen. So it'll happen with weed too. People will be like, dude, you're smoking. Let me drive. They're going to regulate it just as much like in the stock type of way as it would be in the regular law too. So like for example, if, if you're drinking more than like three beers, that usually could get you over like the .008 like yes. limit. So there's probably going to be that type of contraception. Of course, too. that that's going to happen, yeah. right? Uh, what am I gonna, how can you wait until we have the technology if there's no reason to make the technology? Exactly. Right? Once, you, once you legalize and allow people to, to smoke weed, now law enforcement has a need to have technology. Guess what will come up? Technology. That's how it works. Because what will it mean? The government will have to purchase these machines, whatever they are. Ooh, government money. Boy, do businesses like government money. <laughs> Boy, they, and so do bankers. Banks love government money. That's their thing. So if all of a sudden there's government money involved, bankers will give loans to people to create this new technology, whatever it is. I don't have to know what the technology is. Of course they make it. It's already happening already. Yeah, it's growing. Um, so uh, I want to get into the uh, your your infrastructure plan. Mm -hmm. I loved when you were on Joe Rogan. I was listening to it, and I and I thought it was a great idea. Mm -hmm. You actually turned my mom to say I'm going to vote for you because she nice. just loved because she was in the car while I was doing research for this. Mm -hmm. Like she was listening, she loved it. So infrastructure plan. I don't even know why it's even hasn't even happen yet because it makes so much sense. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Let me be very clear why and nothing has happened. Because the people who are running for office are literally career politicians. Yeah. All they know is being in government for the past 18, 20, 25 years. All they know, they can't think outside the box. Hmm. Literally, they can't drain the swamp. They live in a the swamp. They can't change the establishment. They are the establishment. Asking them to change is asking them to burn down their own house. 
Yeah. It's not happening. I can't think outside the box. Impossible. Yeah. So, like, you, uh, what you're saying was, uh, you rent out naming rights. Yes. For highways or bridges and whatever, stuff. And whatever, it. whatever is, whatever is being used or talked about as a marketing tool, we can now use to raise money, right? And the idea of the MTA is what I bring up all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, the MTA is about sixteen billion dollars every year. Of that, about six billion we just give to them. Here's six billion dollars from the government because you suck. That's why you get it because you're incompetent. <laughs> That's true, right? They're bad at what they do, so here's six billion dollars because you're bad at what <laughs> you do. The way you just put it out. Like, yes. It's it's so amusing. And that's literally yeah. true. You're terrible. Here's six billion dollars. Hmm. And we do it every year. So I have an idea. How about we stop that? Yeah. How about we, no extra money to MTA instead we give them ways of raising money. Now, people often say, well, Larry, you're libertarian. You're going to cut everything. Never have I ever once spoke about cutting anything. What I speak about talking is... talking about not being to the individual. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> uh, what I'm talking about is, is actually deciding that let's facilitate ways so we don't have to raise taxes. That's what I'm talking about. Let's facilitate ways to provide surpluses to our state. Our state is $300 billion in debt and has at least a $4 billion deficit, if not more. That's not good. That's ridiculous. And it's a $170 billion budget. Florida has more people than us. And they have an $85 billion budget. Half. Mm. With more people. Something's wrong. But let me, let me finish my point if I could. The MTA. Um, why in the world aren't we, as, as I mentioned before, why aren't we in the world leasing naming rights to our bridges and tunnels? Bridges and tunnels are mentioned every single day. Every single day, they're mentioned in, in, the, in, the, in the newspapers. They're mentioned in TV, radio, during rush hour. Hundreds of times every day. In a 16 million person metro area. You think they wouldn't pay for that? Of course they would. It'll be on Google Maps. When you're on Google Maps yeah. or whatever, it'll be there. It'll be the, the Apple Tunnel or the Google Bridge. It'll be there. Of course it will, right there. How much would they pay for that? Oh my God, so much. They pay $20 million for a stadium that's used on the weekends. I'm talking about something being crossed by hundreds of thousands of cars every day and being mentioned every day in a 16 million metro person area. Of course they pay for that. $100 million, $50 million, whatever. But on top of that, again, we lease the naming rights, but we still own the asset. So we still inspect the asset, right? Still must be inspected. If it goes you know, to a D or a C level, they have to fix it. If they don't fix it, they lose the contract, which means they control maintenance. We'll have safer bridges. Right now, our bridges collapse in New York State. They collapse now. Are we are we at a D ranking right now for the our bridges? The whole country is like a C minus yeah, or something like that. Something yes. like that. <laughs> yes, horrible. Yes. No, no bridges, uh, the bridges collapsed upstate like two months ago. Bridges <laughs> collapsed. My dad was in Fleischmann, so we could definitely attest. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So you, bridges collapse now. And people say, well, if you give the bridges to the private companies, they'll collapse. First off, I'm not giving the bridge to anybody. I'm leasing naming right. We still own it. Second, why in the world would it be a good idea for the Google bridge to collapse? Why would that be good? Third, we're inspecting it, so now if it's a bad inspection, we don't just put it on a list and hope one day it gets fixed, which what hap happens now. We have recourse. Fix it or lose the contract. We'll have safer bridges, and it's the best part. They're paying for maintenance. We have to pay for maintenance. We've lowered, we've lowered spending and less corruption because less money coming out of Albany. Less corruption, lowered spending. We get money, safer bridges, and here's the best part of it all. Get rid of tolls. If oh, they're paying we, we us for it, <laughs> if they're paying us for it and they're taking care of maintenance, why do we have tolls? Hmm. Tolls go away. Hey, if there's one cut you want to make, why not? No, <laughs> that, Especially that, on that. Yeah, but no tolls, right? Exactly. And now the next piece now is how about freight lines? We have rail lines coming out of New York City all over the place, right? Going out to Long Island, going upstate. Why aren't those instead freight lines at night? At night we don't use them, right? Or rarely if we use them at all in passenger trains. Make them freight lines. Bring freight in. But Larry, we'll have to move and change and fix and build things. Yes, and they'll pay for it. How do I know that? It's already happening right now in our airlines. Our airlines rent out gates and the, and the airline company, I'm sorry, the, the airport rents out gates to airlines and the airlines build it out. That's part of their rent. We'll do it to here too, right? Whatever, Home Depot, Amazon, freight forwarders, whoever, they'll do it, right? Whatever, whatever line will use it, yeah. right? They'll rent them out and they'll rebuild it and they'll fix it. And here's the best part. Those lines that they that they build out for tra for transport at night are the same lines we get to use during the day for passengers, which means less maintenance because they're paying for it, which means they're making money, which means less train less truck traffic in the city, less wear and tear on our city infrastructure, less wear and tear on the city, less trucks in the city, less traffic, less everything in the city. Yeah. Win 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 win. So what did I just do? I gave the MTA two different ways of raising money without taxes through marketing its infrastructure and through freight lines through its uh, through its rail infrastructure 
So now all of a sudden now we can make extra money, but we don't need to pay dollars anymore. Last, the MTA is a disaster when it comes to affecting this. It costs up to four times more to replace and to repair tracks the what MTA than any place else. What do you do? First off, the MTA has to be completely rebooted. How? <clears throat> right now, it's one of those boards that His Majesty has, right? One of those boards, authorities. Mm -hmm. Horrible, unaccountable, no one's in charge. No. Top of the board has to be people who are accountable. Local people and or people who are um, not appointed, but who are elected which means you can punish them by getting rid of them. You can call them up, must be transparent, all those things, right? That's first. But then second, there are tons of cities throughout the entire world that have both unions and safety. Why aren't we cutting and pasting their rules? We don't. We have tons of old rules that are put together from the old school here in New York State that, that are useless now. You know, six right. or seven people who do one job right. when two or three can do it now. Hmm. Technology has changed. Things have changed. You don't need four people anymore. You can use it with two. To, kind of to your point, too. So my dad was in the union for, like, construction for mm -hmm. a long time. Yep. And those are big issues that come into problems, too, because you're hiring so many people. At, but at the same time, they'll think of, like, a project that could be for six months, and they all get laid off pretty much for the most part. Yep. Yes, we can change it. We can make it more like other large cities and making that better, making that, that stronger, right? We can do it. And even if we cut it by just half, half is still amazing. Yeah. If we were at just half, we cut it from two, four times as much to just twice as much, just that. Think of all the money we'd save. Think how more efficient we'd be. Think about faster things would get done. And we're raising money through those other two ways. Now we're rocking and rolling. The MTA can be self-sufficient in 40 years. And that's the goal. The MTA should be able to pay for itself within four years. So there should be no money going to them at, within four years. Definitely uh, yeah. looking forward to see if that know, happens for sure. I know Staten Island has the Verrazano Bridge, and, it's the, and it was the bridge we're supposed to be paid off for 50 years ago? Yeah, something yeah, like that. Exactly, something yes, like that. Of course, yes. And it's just the tolls keep going up yep. and up. So like a plan like that, for especially for Staten Island, would be like amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Can you yeah. imagine you've changed the names of all those three bridges and all mm -hmm. of a sudden no tolls on any bridges? Mm -hmm. You go to Staten Island for free? Yeah. Be nice, right? Yeah. People would people would people would celebrate history yeah, every day would, here. People, yes, people it'd be much better. More. People yes. would talk more about Staten Island. They would. You go to free every day. I love it. Absolutely, hundred mm percent. -hmm. Be great. And but here's the best part. What if it became what if it became valuable enough? to travel through Staten Island better. Well, guess what? You might build another road. You might build a bridge. You might build another tunnel. You might build these things, right? But I don't want to build it. How about we let someone else build it? Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. There are people who want to make those new magnet rails or those Google roads. Mm. Why can't make those? Why not? Well, Larry, we can't because this, you know, 440 is a disaster. Well, this is a, okay, great. Why don't we put a Google road above it or underneath it or next to it mm. or whatever? Why not? But Larry, how we do it? Let them build it. They own that road. Their their main, their, their lease. I'm sorry. Their rent for having that road is maintenance on the actual road. Got it. So there was. So now a we don't pay for the road. The road still exists. If you want to use that, you can. Or use their cool magnet road or Google road. Use whatever you want. You have, you have more choices, which will split up the traffic, and we pay less. There was something that you mentioned earlier in that for the MTA. Now, we're kind of jumping to your education plan with that. I wanted to ask a more introspective question, okay. considering the fact that you want to have more local people, like within the sense of like your boards and having that develop over time. Yes. So like, let's say if you were 16 years old, you were about to graduate the 10th grade and wanted to go the extra route into what your plan is. If you were thinking to yourself back then what you wanted to do, what would kind of like your route be? I would have gone. I I would have gone to military academy. Got it. That's what I would have done, mm -hmm. right? And I think you'll find that too. People say, well, "What about football or military, whatever?" There'll be two-year schools for those. There'll be two-year military academies. There'll be two-year football schools. There'll be all kind of cool stuff, right? So I would have gone to military. I was I was I was go. I was in my during the, the, the military when I was 13, 14, 15. Oh wow! Because I wanted to go, I wanted to escape. Or my father died when I was twelve, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get out and escape. And the military was my answer. My father was in the army. So I actually was going to join the Army, not the Marine Corps. Did, I, did you hear this story? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. and so I was going to join the Army, but the Marine Corps recruiter got me, so I joined the Marines. Mm -hmm. But yes, but I was like, but so I would have probably, I probably would have gone to a military academy. Mm -hmm. right? For sure. I probably would have got out and gone to whatever the, that academy was. Mm -hmm. And I probably would have gone to an Army military academy at that time, because I wasn't, at that time I wasn't thinking about the Marine Corps. I was thinking about the Army. So if it had been me back in the 80s when I graduated in the 80s, mm -hmm. I probably would have gone to an Army military academy, unless there would be multiple sources. But as a general rule, it's either an Army academy or a Naval academy. As a general rule, is that a 100% rule? Yeah. But if it was just a military academy, I probably just went to a military academy. 
So, Definitely. So for your your K to ten model, for me especially, like I was never a good test taker. Yep. So you know and, what I'm talking about. Yes. And I took the st all the standard like standardized tests, the regions, the co-op, the I T whatever the test was, the I T B S test in high count. school. Yeah, so like for someone like me who's not a good test taker, and they're all worthless. Yeah, they're all worth. I, I think completely worthless. Yeah. worthless. Yeah. All they do is stress people, oh, make yeah. them yeah, yeah add stress to someone's life, make people feel stupid when they're not. It's mm. just because they can't take a test well. Yeah. It hurts our, our everything. It's nothing but bad, and I love it because now their answer was now they have the advanced regions. You see that? Now we have advanced garbage. It means nothing. No one. If you take if you have to take a regions test. If you're listening now and you're 18, 19, or 17 about Regents, please don't waste your time. Just ignore it. Just opt out. It means nothing. No one ever. This has never happened ever. Let me check your resume. Oh, my God. Regents diploma? <laughs> you are hired. That has never happened ever. So I ridiculous. know. I hire and fire people. Never have I cared for a Regents diploma ever. Nobody cares. It is a worthless thing. It makes no sense whatsoever. It should go away tomorrow. Nobody cares. Yeah. So, uh, I guess, like, go more into your K-10 to plan. Sure. People, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the idea is off the bat, first step, we want to get rid of all standardized testing hmm. until high school. No standardized testing until high school. What does that mean? Because when you're 10, 11, 12 years old, now we're having kids take tests that are standardized that, one, it's an unfair way of grading teachers. It's an unfair way of grading schools. And it makes kids stress and go crazy and feel stupid because they can't take a test, it makes a second class of citizen, what, second class of student for our kids, and there's no indication of success in life. None. Now, standardized testing can be very valuable in high, in high school to figure out where you want to go, what you're good at. I'm fine with it in high school. At that point, you've gone through testing, you know how to test in general, and the test at that point isn't pass or fail, it's what are you better at for your future. Those are very valuable tests, and in high school, you should take them out. If you want to, you should take them, absolutely. But when it comes to elementary school, we're wasting our time. So when that happens, two things will happen. Number one, we'll lose Common Core. Good, don't care, let it go away. Don't care about Common Core at all. Um, if, if you're a teacher and you want to use Common Core for your kid, you can. There is some data that shows that there's a small percentage of kids who actually will learn better on Common Core. If you're a teacher and you have that kid in your class, feel free to use Common Core for that kid if you want to. I'm the only candidate who says, let teachers teach, then I let them. I actually let them teach. I, don't, I pull away administrators and I give them the opportunity to do what's appropriate because the other thing we'll lose is federal funds. Federal funds will go away. Our actual budget for education is about $60 billion. We'll lose about $4 billion. Are we at kind of like $23,000 a student right now? Too? Yeah, $22,000, $23,000. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yes, huge, huge. So we'll lose about $4 billion. When that $4 billion goes away, keep that number in mind, $4 billion, bucks, we will, we'll also lose something else. All the strings attached to those four billion dollars, and there's Sotry. lots of them. Oh, there's so much debauchery with that. Yes, which means tons and tons of administrators, grant writers, box checkers, tons of them. And you might say, well, do we? Do they really matter that much? They do. The average teacher in New York State makes about eighty thousand dollars a year. The average administrator over one hundred fifty. Some make two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. You dump two, three full of those administrators, you can easily hire four, five, six teachers or give them raises or yeah. or buy more computers or more books or whatever the case may be. You can help them out tremendously. The individual uh, district can figure this out. But I'm still not done. I want K through 12, as I said, to go to K through 10. 10th grade, take a test, you pass it, done. You are now, you, you have a high school diploma. You have five options now. Option one, you think college is right for you. That's great, you can go. Why do I say that? We've been told a lie for years, decades. The only way to success is to get a great Regents Diploma from New York State, then go off to college and you get a great job. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. There are many ways to success. That is one way. That is a way. And for some kids, it's the right way. Right. But for most, it's not. How do I know that? If you guys are young enough, you know what high school was. Mm -hmm. 11th, 12th grade was, was gym, study hall, video games, smoking weed. Yes. That's what it was. And for too many kids, that's what it is, right? How do you know how at the, is that bad? Because what's the first year of college? 13th grade. It's a reboot of college, yeah. of high school, because you're not ready for it. A lot of times remedial education. Remedial education, absolutely. Yes, it is. And then it takes the average kid now six years to graduate. The average is six. Most longer. The average is six now, right? Because a lot of going even longer because they're not even graduating. So I get a kid who's 24 years old, never had a job. We wonder, why does he have no work ethic? Huh. He's never had a job. Or worse, he's 24 years old, 
He's got a job, which is great, but here's the problem. He now has a degree that has no value. There's no opportunity for him. And he now has $100,000 in debt. And he's got to work at Starbucks. We wonder why he leaves New York. Yeah. Or once he's 28 years old, goes, he's going to build houses, man. He hmm. says building houses. And here's the problem. The guy who says, I want to build houses, we just stole 10 years of his life for nothing. Right. For a lie. We stole 10 years of his life or her life for nothing. Horrible. For a lie. Now, you have the kid who goes to Bosey's. Bosey's is wonderful. I love Bosey's. It's great. But here's the problem. The image of that is terrible. If you're in high school now and you want to go to Bosey's, they'll literally say things like, you're better than Bosey's. They'll say that to you. Or Bosey's for the dumb kid or for the bad kid. Oh, shame on us for that. Bosey's is good. Bosey's is trades. We need tradesmen in New York. Yeah. Some people like being a tradesman. What's wrong with that? And the guy who goes to Bosey's becomes a plumber. Now he's 24 years old. He has no debt. He's a plumber. He makes at least 80K a year, if not more. That's the one I want to be. I want to be that kid. Right? And he's got 10 years of experience. My God, he's going to be employed the rest of his life. Because of those apprenticeships, they're usually like three to four years. You so got that it. experience is going to accumulate. That, that kid now, is oh, not a kid anymore, he's 24. He's, he can make money the rest of his life. Yeah. The rest of his life he can make money. But the, but the guy who has a degree in history, right? He's screwed. And he got $100,000 in debt. Nothing but bad. So bad, bad, bad. Instead, if you think college is for you, and maybe it is, do a two-year prep school. The prep school prepares you for college. So when you get into college, you're ready to rock and roll. That's no 13th grade for you. You're done. You're set. You're ready to rock and roll. And it's the best part. You might graduate in three years. And since you've got all the basics done already, you got it in prep school, and maybe you're doing internships, incubators, you get real experience. Much better way of using college, uh, your college time and college experience. But let's say you're not. You're that super smart kid, that kid who tests amazingly well. That's who you are. You're that kid who, 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 who's book smart. There's no tomorrow. You're that kid. Awesome. Take your SAT at 16, get an associate's degree. You know if you're a doctor anyway, start early. Go. Yeah. That's who you are. You're that kid. Awesome for you. Let's say you're neither of those two kids. You're a kid who says, you know what I want to do? I want to be a plumber. I want to be a mechanic. Awesome. Go to trade school. Two-year trade school, either you wind up at the end of those two years with either a, a, a license, if appropriate, or an apprenticeship, as you mentioned. One of the two, depending on right. what you're doing, right? D different trades obviously have different rules. But either one, you're either ready to go get an apprentice, uh, apprenticeship, or you're licensed. Life is good either way. You're ready to work. But you don't want any of those. Go work. Go get a job. What's going to happen? If this is the 1800s. I was going to get trapped in a loom and die. Yeah. It's not going to happen anymore, right? Just go get a job. Learn what it is, what it is, to, what it means to have a boss. Learn what it means when your boss says show up at eight. Your boss doesn't mean nine thirty. He means seven forty-five. Right. Learn those things at sixteen. Learn what it means to pay taxes. Learn what it means you go. I'm making fifteen bucks an hour. Oh my God, no, I'm making ten. Ah, the government took my money. Learn that at sixteen. Learn what it means to pay your bills. It's not how much you make, it's how much you save. Bingo, learn that too. Yeah. Yes. How many times do kids that. go off? They don't. Exactly yeah. right. Yes, you are so right. Now I'll go off to college and my credit is destroyed because I have no idea how to handle my money. But if I learn at 16, I make the mistake there. The cost for failure at 16 is much lower than the cost for failure at 26. I don't want, we have too many people in their 20s right now in this country. This is New York State, but the entire country. Who, If you ask them, do you feel like an adult? Over half will say no. You guys know you're young enough to know adulting. Mm. You know what that is? <laughs> adulting, yeah. You know it. Yeah. Yes, you're young enough to know that. Yes, that's a thing, right? That shouldn't exist. But part of it is we're pushing our kids out to not become adults, right? They can be on, on health care until they're, what, 26 now, is yeah, it? Yeah, it was 26. 26, and we don't want them to do anything except go to college, right? And that's, we don't want them to work, and we don't want them to do anything. I have an idea. Go work. Go. In fact, not just go work. Go fail. Go fail. Another thing people say, Blair, how do you pay for this? All right, here's how you pay for it. Number one, um, when I was a Marine, I got out and I got the GI Bill. And the GI Bill says you have X dollars and Y years to spend it. We have the same thing. You're at 16, you get $20,000, seven years to spend it. Good luck. What happens? That sits in an account somewhere in New York State. If you use it, you pay to school, school gets the money. Here's what's going to happen, I guarantee it. A bunch of prep schools will pop up. Guess how much they're going to cost for two years? $20,000. A bunch of trade schools are going to pop up. Guess how much it's going to cost for two years? $20,000, <laughs> right? A bunch of, uh, a bunch of cool um, associate degree programs will come up from the colleges. Guess how much that'll cost? $20,000. How do I know that? Because it's guaranteed government money. And banks love guaranteed government money, mm -hmm. which means they will give loans, which means these schools will pop up. Of course they will. As I said before, banks love government money. They love that like there's no tomorrow. So they'll happily take it. They'll, they'll come out. What does that mean? 
That means we're spending $10,000 per child per year for those last two years. Right now, as you said, we're spending $22,000, $23,000. Yeah. We're saving between twelve dollars and $13,000 every single year per kid. There's about 400,000 Levis wealth creators. That's more than $4 billion. <laughs> we have made up all the federal funds, plus more, and got rid of tons of administrators, and got rid of tons of strings, which means teacher burnout goes away. Teacher burnout right now is horrible. You ask teachers why? It's all because of administration. That goes away. So we have happier teachers. And let me see, last piece, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. And, but not just that. Think about the 11th and 12th grade. Now, if you're an 11th, 12th grade teacher, everybody in your class wants to be there. They've all chosen it. You're a student. Everybody in your class wants to be there. They've all chosen it. Better experience for everybody. And guess what else? Less bullying, less alienation, more community, more purpose. This goes right to school safety. This goes right to school safety. The bad kid, I'm putting in quotes, bad kid, he's a bad kid or she's a bad kid because they don't want to be there. Yeah. That's why they're the bad kid. If, they want, if they're where they want to be, want to be working on some other school, they're not the bad kid anymore. They're the productive. That's correct. What's killing our kids is not guns. What's killing our kids is three things. Lack of, lack of purpose, lack of community, and loneliness. This will help alleviate that also. It's not a cure-all, but it helps tremendously. Happier kids, happier teachers, happier parents, better results, less money, and an obvious surplus to every single school district. It can now decide how it wants to spend its money, or even <gasps> lower school taxes. Mm -hmm. Even that if they want to. <laughs> yes, they can decide how to use the money themselves. So all of that could happen with this plan. To your point on that too, so there's a, there's a big part with teachers in terms of how they start up their school year. Yes. So many times they have to spend their own money to help yes. with like the classroom supplies, and you have to rely on outlets such as like a donor, yep. uh, donors cruise, I think it's called. Yeah. If 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 the donors want to do that, they still may. It's right. your money, feel free. But what I don't want to do is make it to where it's required. That's the problem. We have it to where if they don't get it, the kids are suffering. Yeah. Right. I don't want that. No kid should suffer. Exactly. That's, that's a problem, right? But if you want because you're rich and you want to help your school district out, you want to give them money, go ahead, lucky school district. But it doesn't mean the rest are suffering. Right. It means they don't get the cool thing you gave them, and that's fine. I mean, you can do that if you want to. I don't know why you would, but you could. But I just don't want others to suffer. Definitely. So, so yeah, if you, again, you're some rich guy who wants to give your school a new gym, go ahead. Uh, what about charter school? I know the mayor wants to get rid of charter school. Yeah, but, but this program, they're, they're virtually not necessary. Oh, okay. So they're yeah. required. But right. if you want to, I, locally do what you want. That's my point. Mm. If you think charter schools will work locally, go. If you think it won't, don't. I'm really okay. I want to give a lot of this back. And here's how I want to fund it. Here's the issue. Funding's a problem. It is. So what I want to try doing is I want to start making to where all the funding comes from the state alone. Nothing comes from local counties. That's my goal to make that happen. And it's a flat fee. Right? You have whatever. I have 10,000 students in my district, whatever that number is, and we're gonna be a flat fee. In this case, I'm making the number up. In theory, it's $15,000. 15,000 times 10,000, there's your check, good luck. As long as you are transparent. That's what I want. Now let's figure out how to make that work best in our school district. That's what I want to make happen. Definitely. Cool, cool. Yes. Um, so here, here, here's, a, here's a good question, here's a funny question. Okay. Why do you think the governor is refusing to debate you and everyone else, like, well, he did debate. Mo, um, no, he, mo, mo, he no. debated twice. He debated yeah. um, Nixon oh. and he debated Mona. Oh yeah, well, why do you think he's refusing to like come and debate all the other candidates? Like, why would he? Play? He's winning. You don't gamble when you're winning. You gamble when you're losing. Hmm. It's just tactical. I mean, he doesn't care. Yeah. The, look, he doesn't even answer questions from the media. Why would he answer questions from anybody else? Hmm. Right? Mm. He just wanted to beat up Molinaro and show how weak he was. He did a good job of it before. I mean, he beat mm. the public up badly. Did you watch the debate? Oh, uh, you bits and pieces. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It was unwatchable. I yeah. mean, it was a yeah. slaughter. He, he hammered him into submission. I don't particularly think he's a good debater anyway. Who? Um, Cuomo. Yes, he is. He's, he's a bully. And if you can't send him to the bully, you get crushed, which yeah. is what happens. He, he, beat up, he beat up Nixon, and he, and he beat up uh, Molinaro. Mm. He's a bully. And if you can't stand up to the bully, you fall down. And Nixon had a worse problem, right? Yeah. Nixon had a bigger problem, and, and it's, it's a cultural issue for her. You know, How does she stand for the bully but not fall back to being the, the mean woman? 
right? Mm, right. So she had an extra problem she had to deal with, which is totally unfair to be before. It's unfair. It shouldn't be the case. Her gender shouldn't matter. Yeah. Sadly, for many people, it did. Mm. And I wish that wasn't true. It is for her. She had to worry about it. So she had an extra thing to navigate on top of that, right? It was an issue for her. Marlon didn't. He should have just been able to beat him up, and he couldn't. Mm. To your point on that, too, because kind of with that boy mentality, unfortunately and inevitably, there has to be a support system behind it. So what I'm curious from you and just from your experience, Mm -hmm. do you feel like on kind of like a staff level of like your uh, people and same thing with like the other politicians, do you feel like it should be better as like a less is more or more support overall? Like less I'm not people. Not really sure what you're asking. Sure. So like more pe- Like, do you think it's better to have more people on your campaign staff or to have less people on your? Campaign oh, always campaign. more. Oh my God, yeah. always more. No exception. The more, the better. Yes. I mean, I have a lot. I have a campaign manager. I think seven or eight directors. A lot. Seven or eight directors. Probably at least another twelve deputy directors. Yeah. Is my guess. Um, I don't know all people who work on my campaign. Um, and at least. 10 to 15 more daily volunteers, I mean daily volunteers, and hundreds of, you know, here or there volunteers. Sure. I need more. I could always use more. I mean, yes, more, more, more. The more people who get out there, the name recognition for a third party in particular is everything. That's every. If my name gets out there, I win. Yeah. That's how it works. And I'm making that up. That The last poll we released, um, I was at 30, it's about a month ago, I was at 33% name recognition. And I was pulling at 13%. Now, you guys didn't go through Common Core, so you can do math. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, uh, and if you multiply 33... Three examples how to do it, we'll solve it. There we go, exactly, yes. <laughs> if, you, if you multiply 33 times 3, you'll get almost 100, right? So if yeah. I get 100%, you multiply 13 times 3, that's 39. This is a five-way race. 30% wins. So if I get 100% aim recognition, I'm nine points of a victory. So I don't even need, I don't even need 100%. I need about 80, 85% aim recognition this is a winnable race. This, Definitely. this race is winnable. If I get my name out, which is why I'm doing things like this, right? I'm the only guy doing podcasts. Nobody else is. Only one doing it. And so many of them to get your name out there. Yes. I did them all the time. I did one this morning. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, awesome. <laughs> did one this morning in Manhattan and I'm doing one now. Yes, I do them all the time. I actually have uh, one for tomorrow night and, and one for Friday night. I do podcasts all the time. I did Glenn Beck. I did Dave Rubin, Dave Smith, um, Joe Rogan. Uh, oh, my God. Just, I, all of them. Whatever I can get, I grab. All the time. Yeah, and that shows a lot of people like our generation, because it's mostly our generation that listens to podcasts. Yep. And that's, like you said, name recognition. 100%. People recognize yes. you, yeah. And something else. Look, the youth tend to not vote. Yeah. Right? Compared to, to, yeah. compared to senior citizens vote way more than the youth do, right? Yeah. So if I get the youth out to vote, that's where I get all my new voters. Bernie taught us this in 2016. Trump taught us this in 2016. Look at the youth vote. The youth vote can often swing it. When the youth gets out and votes, that guy or gal usually wins. To kind of revert to your point with having more people like on the ground for staff and things of that sort, so I wanted to ask like another like introspective uh, question. So, could you could you remember the first time you've ever had to knock on doors yourself? And how Barry you, Johnson, twenty twelve. Sure. So, how would you best advise people to go, kind go of have that approach? Go in a group. Go in a group because going by yourself is scary. Sure. Go in a group. If you want to do that, you want to get and support any candidate, please support me. But if you want to support <laughs> any candidate... There's the plug. Yes, there you go. If you want to support any candidate, here's the issue. Don't go by yourself. Get a bunch of guys. Get together at a certain time, right? Uh, Bob, Jane, and Phil are all going to show up on the corner of 1st and Main at 2 o'clock on Tuesday. And we all show up. Probably going to be the weekend on Wednesday. I mean, on, on, on Saturday, whatever. So all show up. Boom. Great. We show up. All right. What are we doing? Let's go together down the street and knock on doors. That's the way to do it. Or let's get together and sit in my house and make phone calls. Or let's sit together and put up flyers. Always go in groups. And a group should be three or more. Just two, mm. you'll sit around and talk. It's what you do. Two people will just sit around and talk. Which is great, but not enough. You need at least three, four or five is even better. That's the answer. And uh, just another final point to that. So in terms of like, in terms of having so many people on it, like, how do you feel like the best ways to go about it, like from neighborhood to neighborhood? Totally depends on the neighborhood. There's yeah. no way I can answer that question. Gotcha. I mean, there are places where you should not knock on doors and places where it's the only way to make things happen. Yeah. This is local people knowing what's right. I mean, look, um, if you want to help out, you want to knock on doors, great. Go to LottoShop.com. Sure. That's my plug. 
right? LarrySharp.com, if you want to help, you think what I'm saying makes sense to you, you want to tell your friends, whatever the case may be, Larry Sharp for New York Facebook page, Larry Sharp Twitter, Larry Sharp Instagram. Go there, share, 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 share everything. Tell people about this campaign. Name recognition is everything. Just tell your friends about it. You don't have to pitch me if you don't want to. Please pitch me. You don't have to, though, <laughs> if you don't want to. You can just say, hey, do you know about Larry Sharp? And have them check me out on their own. As you know, if you Google Larry Sharp, you will get a lot of stuff. I am all over the place. So feel free to do that if you want to. No worries. But something else, if you can donate, donate. If you have the money, give it. If you've got thousands of dollars, if that's where you are in your life right now, where you could you could donate thousands of dollars, you should. But Larry, I want to save my thousands of dollars. Well, if you make me governor, your taxes will go down, your opportunity to go up, you'll make even more. It's a good investment. But say you're not in a position. You can't do it. You can't do thousands. You can do ten dollars. Ten is fine. Let's say you're struggling. You can't do any. No worries. Share, share, share. You can still be that keyboard warrior, right? If you don't have the cash, give me some time. If you've got the time, great. If you don't have the time, give me some cash. Give me what you have most of. If only somebody in New York won that two point, what was it, two point seven billion dollars? Oh, yes. 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 yes, 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 absolutely. Oh, yeah. Would have yeah. been nice <laughs> for sure. <laughs> absolutely, would have been nice. Been so, nice. thanks guys for having me. I appreciate no, it. Thank yeah, you. no problem. Thank you for yes. coming on. Christian, Christian, Christian. That was episode fifteen with Larry Sharp. Fifty-five minutes of just great transparency, just a very open-minded individual and somebody who, in my opinion, is always looking out for you. Oh yeah, definitely. And uh, um, just, you know, just if you guys were changed by what he said, you know, go out and vote on Tuesday. Just vote. That's all you need to do is vote and you can change just the world. It's a cliche to say, but your vote does count. Regardless, regardless, regardless of what your politics are, your vote does count. Cliches can always mean something, though, in that extent, because think of it this way. Those cliches mean so much to people in terms of how they can make a difference and it's shown time and time again that those actions can really make an impact for people. Yeah, and like I said, you got a little bit of time left before uh, for the midterm elections. Get out there. Get Larry's name out there, LarrySharp.com. Um, everything, just go door to door. As he said, watch, watch out. Don't do anything, you know, crazy and stuff. But yeah, but, um, every little bit counts. There is no, uh, little, I guess, uh, endorsement that you can't do. 100%. So yeah, so, uh, oh, you're going to say something, Jerry? And Christian, <laughs> when do you feel like I can knock on your door? Uh, you knock on my door now. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Hashtag grassroots. Yeah, so you can find us on, uh, YouTube at Caputo, Coll Caputo Collective, Caputo Productions. Just type that into the search engine. Hit that uh, bell on the side so you know when we're going to be on, when we're going to drop content, whether it be this, Collective Gaming, which is going to come back soon after a break. Um, just other things. We're behind-the-scenes footage, updates from everything. Uh, you can find us on Stitcher. Find us on Apple, I Apple Podcasts, Apple iTunes, Droid Podcasts. Anchor, I said Stitcher. Um, just, yeah, find us on there. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, on Anchor, we have a little wallet, so you can uh, donate. Every little bit counts if you feel inclined to donate. You have any? Uh, you have anything you gotta share, Jerry? Your retail crawl, something? <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say, again, amazing interview, mm -hmm. and uh, just a couple things to promote. Upcoming is Friendsgiving for Sunrise Day Camp. We will be at Buffalo Wild Wings for November 19th, which is a Monday, and that will be all day. Show your support. Please show up to that, and 15% of your bill will be going back to help kids with cancer. Go to summer camp for six weeks free of charge. Also, December 8th, to promote again, we will be having our festive holiday karaoke event at Karaoke 1-7. That's going to be a great time, and as, as I always say, Bring those voices and sing out those choices. Yeah. So there you go. All the endorsements, everything, plugs, Larry Sharp, everybody's on. Uh, so yeah. So um, that's all I have to say before I start babbling on. Uh, hopefully we'll have some type of update for Hillsboro soon. Later, sooner rather than later. Even I'm excited for Oh this yeah, time. I'm excited too. But um, yeah. So I'm um, just, uh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know you. what to say. I have no closing, Jerry, because I'm just still... You just got to say love you in everything that you do. Okay. So, thanks for listening. 
listen to the archives. We have a bunch of other interviews on the archives on YouTube and on Stitcher. And yeah, so uh, want to thank want to thank Larry Sharp again for coming all the way out to our to Jerry Square. I still can't believe that. Yeah, and yeah, so uh, just thanks everybody for listening and get out there. Bro.